I am Farah Karapedian, a professor here at USD in the Department of Art, Architecture, and Art History. Thank you for being here, and thank you to Lindy Villa, Shakira Smith, Ron Kaufman, Brian Clack, and Noel Norton for your help and for giving me the opportunity to organize this series of talks. Um, we're here for Frontiers in Frontiers, sponsored by USD's Humanities Center. And we're going to listen to practitioners from a variety of disciplines as they describe their strategies in assessing the real and potential ecologies, architectures, economies, and relations of our borderlands. These panels are developed in conversation with the Innovation Law Lab, a nonprofit founded to harness the power of technology, law, and activism in a single organization to end the mass incarceration of children and mothers. Attendees can get involved in producing a deliverable, analyzing the ecosystem of Imperial Valley, which is developing around the Imperial Regional Detention Facility. Our guiding question really is what, what alternatives to detention can the talks reveal as better futures for the people in the area? So today, when I acknowledge that we are speaking from the unceded territory of the Kume people, I hope that you hear in that invocation of a past that is very present for us, um, a chance to think broadly about future, how it's organized, what it looks like, who lives where and how. Um, so over the course of the next couple of Thursdays, we'll hear from an architect, philosopher, artists, um, USD's inaugural class of border fellows um, at the Croc Center. And finally, we'll have a field trip with Manuel Schwarzberg Carillo, um, actually along the um, aqueduct uh, that, that stretches towards Imperial Valley as a kind of an alternate um, notion of a border and its history. Um, so I want you to know that scope before we begin today because the vision here is that nothing gets done, nothing gets accomplished in a vacuum or alone. We need one another's perspectives and the diversity of disciplines and identities represented in this conversation, it's only a small swatch of what we'll need as we look forward to our work in this area. Um, so today we'll hear from Ariel Prado, who directs Innovation Law Lab's uh, anti-carceral legal organizing program, Evelyn Diaz Cruz, professor of theater and affiliate faculty of ethnic studies at the University of San Diego, Dr. Kate Borsma, uh, assistant professor in the biology department and an aquatic ecologist working in desert streams and rivers. And Dr. Peter Nuck, research associate at the Center for Sustainable Finance at the University of London, adjunct professor at the School of International Service at American University, senior research associate at the Global Economic Governance Program at the University of Oxford. I also want you to know that um, next week in in person, we'll have copies of Evelyn's new book, Applied Theater with Youth, Education, Engagement, and Activism. Um, so with no further ado, uh, let's, let's hear from Ariel Prado, who will help us frame this experiment, this thought experiment, um, with his own um, actual experience in Imperial Valley. Ariel, take it away. have to acknowledge the recording. Thank you, Farah. Um, for what it's worth, for my end, you do not sound at all like a robot. Um, so uh, yeah, for what that's worth. It's it's really nice to be on this call with all of you all. I actually don't think I've met anyone on this call before. So I've got the slightest bit of stage fright, but I'm, I'm going to work through that. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, again, my name is Ariel Prado or Ariel Prado. I work with Innovation Law Lab, where I am a co-director with our anti-carceral legal organizing project. Um, 
I'll move into it, I guess, straight away. I mean, I, I kind of want to frame a little bit around why, you know, why even begin to think about alternatives to, to incarceration? Why think about alternative economic models, architectural models, alternative kind of systems of relationship to incarceration? Um, and kind of as an advocate who works in direct services, who works with families in detention um, and individuals in detention, um, it's really kind of intuitive to come to this conversation from a place of recognizing the harm that detention centers create. Um, so I just wanna like name the kind of fundamental harm of incarceration, uh, the separation from communities of support that incarceration kind of creates and, and recreates, and then the weaponized use of isolation. And so we see people, you know, not only isolated in very often rural areas where they, again, are separated from the communities of support, but there's actually kind of within the carceral facility or within the prison, within the jail, within the immigrant detention center, this like um, escalation of isolation that's used as a punitive measure um, for, you know, talking back to the guard, um, for organizing to denounce the conditions, for speaking to reporters, um, for really doing anything that challenges um, the kind of power structure within the jail. Um, and so just that it's, at, it's kind of like base, fundamental, like that is the harm that incarceration commits, I guess, and, and that it recruits one group of people to commit against another. Um, but it also makes people vulnerable to other forms of harm. Um, and I think often in the news, that's, that's the kind of piece that um, as advocates, that's, that's the piece that we're more able to get across, I guess, um, when there's something exceptional beyond kind of that fundamental um, or, or basic harm that incarceration kind of commits. Um, we're most able to call attention to incarceration and, and to paint it in kind of, uh, I guess, with, with a bright light to kind of expose what it truly is when uh, there's exceptional harm um, in addition to that kind of harm in the first instance. And so when we think about it, I mean, I think COVID is a really good example where people in jails, prisons, detention centers are made particularly vulnerable to the pandemic because they don't have a choice. They don't have their bodily autonomy has been stripped. They don't have a choice over whether or not to socially distance. They don't have a choice but to be in a congregate setting that makes them particularly vulnerable to the spread of a deadly pandemic or a deadly disease. Um, but we also saw it, um, and maybe I was nervous. I didn't introduce myself properly at all. One of the things I did mean to say uh, to start out with is um, most recently, and so it's freshest on my mind, um, I spent about a year um, working with a visitation team at the Irwin County Detention Center. Um, maybe that's not the most recently, second most recently. Most recently, we've started a project at Imperial, but I, I want to take some time to talk about the Irwin County Detention Center, and then I'm going to shift to Imperial. Um, folks might have seen Irwin County Detention Center kind of in the news in 20, this would have been 2020, going into 2021, fall of 2020. Um, it was also overshadowed by the election, so it's, it's very possible that folks did not see it. Uh, but in the fall of 2020, there were allegations of really horrific gynecological abuse at the Irwin County Detention Center. Um, and there were stories of women going to see the gynecologist and um, not to kind of go into too much detail, but, but to make a long story short, what the gynecologist was doing was uh, diagnosing folks, diagnosing people with the most um, kind of egregious diagnosis that he could based on very limited testing in order to um, prescribe the most expensive procedures he could um, so that he could build a government for that extra money. And so what that did 
in its effect was to um, coerce women into sterilization um, and into operations and procedures that put them at risk of sterilization um, without, often without, you know, I guess, and, and I say women, but, but without any of them really knowing what the procedure was or without many knowing what the procedure was. Those who knew what the procedure was, we're often moving forward kind of having been told that they very likely had cancer and later upon getting out of detention, learning that actually there was no way to know um, and that it didn't seem like um, sufficient testing had been done. Um, and that's that's a, a pattern. It was exposed at ICDC through a ton of, of labor, but the there were other kind of medical profiteers that um, didn't, get exposed to quite the same degree. There was a dentist, and, and this is actually true across detention centers. Um, it, it happens at Imperial as well, where the dentists won't do cleanings, they won't do fillings, they won't do any preventative work. And the reason that they won't is because the government won't pay them the same amount that it pays them to pull teeth. And so people who have been in detention for a very long time you'll often find that they're missing several teeth. I've, I've met people who are, I actually met one man at ICDC who was missing all of his teeth because he had been detained there for two years, um, didn't have access to preventative care and um, eventually had to have every single one of his teeth pulled. So it's just another, I guess, one of the ways that I think detention makes people vulnerable to additional forms of harm, not just the harm of, of incarceration itself, um, but they're a captive market for people for profiteering medical professionals and, and other folks who kind of uh, see a way to exploit their their situation. Um, at Imperial, we we recently worked with um, a coalition of advocacy organizations and nine men detained at Imperial to file a federal complaint. Um, focused on the toxic air, water, mold in the facility. Um, Imperial County, as I understand it, has one of the poorest air qualities on any given day, um, definitely in the country and I believe on the continent. Um, and the detention center itself has really poor air filtration systems, the doors are not properly sealed. And so what we were hearing again and again, and actually it was Freedom for Immigrants, I think that kind of compiled a lot of this information. What we were hearing again and again was that um, folks were getting nosebleeds, folks with asthma were, were having asthma attacks, that the quality of air, the dust, this constant smell of sewage was making it really hard to eat. And there were all kinds of health complications that, were reported, but you know, going undiagnosed. But they were being reported over the hotline to Freedom for Immigrants. They were being reported to attorneys who were taking cases at Imperial, and some of the folks we were talking with were reporting them as well. Um, and so again, you have this situation where the initial harm is the fact that people are being um, denied access to their communities of support. I've talked with parents who you know, are weeping in detention because they're gonna miss their child's second birthday in a row, third birthday in a row, or because they're gonna miss Christmas with their children. Um, I talked with in, in Irwin again, a, a 50 year old man whose father died while he was in detention. Um, and he had had to say goodbye over a lagging uh, video call that buffered the entire time. And so he wasn't even sure if his father had heard him say goodbye and there were no mental health services available at the detention center. When he asked for a grief counselor, he was told that he could have the same pills that anyone else with depression had. Um, all to say, they're, they're harmful, terrible places. Um, I wanna, I'm not sure, actually I actually have no idea how long I've been talking for, so I wanna check in and make sure that I have a bit more time, but I, if I do, I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of Imperial County and, and um, what happens when we try to shut a detention center down. Do I have like another five minutes or so? Yeah, yeah go for it, five minutes. Okay, great, okay. thank you. Um, 
one of the things we learned from Erwin, and one of the things we're seeing again in Imperial County is, um, so as, as I'm, I'm an accredited representative, that means that I have been approved by the Department of Justice to represent folks in removal proceedings before immigration judges and before the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and so I come to this from a very specific angle. I come to this work taking on cases for people in immigration proceedings of some kind. Um, and it took a minute. I mean, I've always kind of understood in the back of my mind that there's a similar experience that people in criminal proceedings go through. And actually going into Irwin every day, Irwin County Detention Center was split between a US Marshals contract and an ICE contract. And so I knew that there were people in the exact same conditions, but for a, a kind of legal definition and, and a legal posture, I was never in contact with those people um, because I didn't have access to them because of kind of my accreditation. In Irwin, that was, it was kind of the one facility, there was another jail, but there were, there were very few carceral faci facilities and ICDC really is like the Irwin County Detention Center really is kind of the center of carceral activity in Irwin County. Imperial is kind of wild. Um, there are at least nine carceral facilities, so nine prisons, jails, detention centers, CBP processing centers in Imperial County. And that's like, mm a pretty superficial search. Like a, there are probably others, um, but that's what I've kind of been able to map out so far and what our team has been able to map out so far. Um, and I bring that up because there's a, a kind of a, I don't know if I would call it a culture, but I'll, I'll leave it to other folks on this call to kind of define exactly what it is. But there are a set of norms that get established when you have a community that has such a large carceral footprint, I guess, so many carceral facilities. Um, Irwin County, the detention center represent, was the second largest employer. So right after the public school system, the Irwin County Detention Center employed the second largest number of people. I think it was 200, about 200 people in a town of 3,000. Um, Imperial, I think the Imperial Valley Community College, I should have looked, I should have it written down for something like this. Um, but I know that there was a study done recently that uh, projected that um, correctional officers, that that job was going to be the third fastest growing job in Imperial County among kind of like high paying entry level jobs. And so that is one of the things that comes up again and again and again when we get in, involved in campaigns to shut down detention centers, um, where we've done the work of kind of highlighting the harm, where we've done the work of, of getting advocates to agree that this is particularly egregious maybe within the system overall. So when we start to engage with the local community, there, there is this tension you know, we, we kind of ask, you might ask like if, if, if we know that they're harmful, if we know that they, they commit all this harm and make people vulnerable to so much other harm, why do they exist? And, and a big part of the reason that they exist is, is for this reason that maybe seems obvious um, to folks, but it's that they provide employment in places where employment is really scarce. That's at least one of the significant reasons that, that we get pushback. Um, and I guess I, I just, when we begin these campaigns or when we engage in these campaigns, what we find is that um, very often the folks in administrative positions will deny that the harm takes place. They'll dehumanize the folks who are being harmed. Um, and so find ways to blame them for the harm that they're experiencing. Um, elected officials who support the facility will often tokenize the guards and you know without ever having necessarily spoken with the staff talk about how brave they are and how they stand behind the guards and behind the facility as a way to kind of prop it up um and if we're doing our job right if, if we're like really doing a good job of, of demonstrating just how harmful the facility is 
some of the best conversations I've had about this have been with the guards and facilities who have pulled me aside on visitate when I've been doing visitation and and said to me, you know, I wish I could quit my job and join y'all. I in in Irwin, I spoke with a woman who um, who told me that she had never meant for this to be her career, that she had taken on the job as a as a summer job, but had never been able to get past it because when she was a correctional officer, nobody would hire her in any other um, in any other position. Um, and we've talked about the fact that it represents a federal jobs program, that it's 10 to $20 million a year uh, that the federal government is investing in these facilities to create these jobs that people really don't, don't want. And so the more that we kind of like highlight harm, I think the more the people who work in those facilities begin to question whether or not that's a place that they really wanna be working. Um, but it doesn't do the next step, I guess, which is what these, these panel discussions I think are, are in large part about, which is, you know, not just say like, this is, we need to get rid of these things. We need to, to shut these places down, but to actually offer an alternative to the folks in the community to say, you know, if, if it's not this detention center, what is the project um, that your community could invest in? What is the project that the federal government could help you build um, so that you can transition away from these relationships of, of harm? Um, Thank you. I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Farah. That's perfect. Thank you. And that's a great transition. <laughs> um, thank you, Ariel. Nice to meet you, by the way. <laughs> um, did we say Evelyn would be contributing next? Yes. Let's do it. And I almost want to take a minute. <laughs> I know, it's a lot. It is a lot. And, and my heart is pounding and... Um, I'm going to try to just do my best um, with that kind of, I mean, I'm so grateful for that. Um, thank you, Farah, for inviting me to this conversation with people that are doing such amazing work. And um, it's, it's always that kind of mix of, you know, inspiring you to action when you hear something uh, like uh, Ariel was just describing and all of the triggers, you know, for, uh, for uh, traumatized groups, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, so, you know, but what's, what's really powerful to me also is, you know, it's so easy to forget these things are happening and that's the power of a good story. And so I'm using that as a segue to say that, you know, theater folks, um, Yes, we do capture those stories. And we also, um, I was struck by the word dehumanizing conditions. And, in, and I, the reason it resonated with me because theater, theater folks, we're, we're telling stories to humanize. So, I mean, that's a direct call to action for us. You know, we're, we're called to witness. And, um, and those of us that are in applied theater, which is theater that um, engages with community and theater that is um, created around a specific issue of concern for communities that, you know, probably there's a good chance they've never even stepped foot in a, in an actual theater event. So, um, so um, with that, I want to say a little bit about my background. Um, is that I have done applied theater in a myriad of settings. I mean, the list is just so long because I'm kind of old now. So it's like, you know, 20 plus years of doing this. So when you invited me to this, though, I've never been in the prisons. I I know kind of my limitations. And I think um, being too empathic, it would, it, would, uh, it would be a lot for me to handle that. But I have done... Um, uh, the alternative to prison, which is working with um, males and females in recovery as opposed to um, serving jail time. And so those, those were really impactful uh, stories. So what we do is, and also I've done the migrants in living in the canyons in Escondido. That was, that was quite a, a semester. And I've done uh, Key West to be more specific to what you, you were asking me to, to speak about. 
uh, Key West, which is so controversial. Um, so we, um, so the, again, you know, my students, we, um, we do philosophical grounding in the first part of the course, and then we actually engage and go to theater um, exercises. I'm a little breathless because, you know, I, so you're gonna have to forgive me. <laughs> so um, we, we go into different communities, we play, we hang out, we have fun, and we, um, we see what stories inspire us. We are absolutely uh, philosophically opposed to trauma mining and trying to get those kinds of stories. You know, we, our humanities, our shared humanities are, are what we're seeking. And that's a real philosophical underpinning of, uh, of uh, theater practitioners engaged in this specific branch of theater, that it's not for the purpose of going to Hollywood, okay? It's for the purpose of uh, telling a good story, right? So um, the book, well, I'm gonna say a little bit, just a little bit about the book, and then I wanna share some visuals of, uh, of work that I've done in the past, because I thought, well, it's kind of nice to live with that, to lead with that and to show you the theater. Okay, so um, one of them, ah, so the book is called Applied Theater with Youth, Education, Engagement, and Activism. And it just came out this summer and it's um, a collection of essays that highlights the value and efficacy of applied theater, which is actually quite interdisciplinary. And when we have our book party on the 17th, you'll all be seeing the invitations come out soon, um, or the, the, the notice coming out soon. Um, you'll see that we have a rich panel of interdisciplinary um, folks doing it. So we actually, we have Odesma uh, Darmipul from the School of Engineering who uses theater in her STEAM practices, right? So the arts, she's been including theater since she came onto campus as a way to, yes, and there's ways of doing that. So you give me a topic and I'll show you how you can do a theater that will enhance those lessons in an embodied kind of way. And, um, and so uh, she'll be on the panel. We have Soroya Rowley, my protege, who has taught the class. She's the only other person I've even trusted with that class because of knowing her background and her sincere uh, spirit. That um, it's a class that's really delicate. It's a delicate class to teach because you're, you're working with issues of uh, race, uh, gender, um, you name it. Um, and the book has put practitioners that are specifically dedicated to these practices in conversation with each other. And so um, the, it's nine chapters, goodness, and each chapter has at least three authors on initiating and responding. Anyway, not to get too much into that, but I want to get you excited to come to hear the panel. We also have, um, uh, who else is on the panel? I'm going, I'm drawing a blank. Jade uh, Power Sotomayor, who's a USD professor, and she teaches dance in the Afro-Caribbean tradition of the Puerto Rican people. Um, and um, it's gonna be co-moderated by Josen Diaz and uh, Marcel Mace Cohen. And so we're gonna have the, we're gonna have the panel discussion, and then we're gonna have a book signing, and then we're gonna have the bomba and a reception afterwards. Bomba is the dance tradition that I was referring to. Okay, so enough of that. Now that I did my nice hearty plug, it got me a little grounded though. <laughs> so, all right. We, um, I want to share my screen to show you a work that I did. Um, uh, well, it's been some years now, but it's significant because, well, with a grant from the Transborder Institute, I was able to work bi-nationally with artists from Tijuana and artists on this side, plus our students, and then also <laughs> create for the second act a, uh, a, a cemetery in front of the, the 
studio theater, that patio in back of Camino Founders. So a cemetery was set up and the storyline and so was of a, a young woman that uh, she goes with her friends to party on the graves and um, she has family from Tijuana, you know, so it was bilingual. The singing was actual Day of the Dead music um, from artists from Tijuana, pianists from Tijuana. Um, and it was it was a blast that the second act, we were partying in the graveyard. Thing about the graveyard is that we invited the community in San Diego and Tijuana and USD and student groups. Art had a, a, an altar, you should know Farah. <laughs> uh, so we were all working collaboratively, setting up, everyone set up an altar and community groups were able to cross pollinate and speak, and it was a chance to make a political statement with your altar. So it was it was a really nice grant that I got. I was I'll always be grateful um, to the Trans Border Institute for supporting that. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to share my screen just to give you some visuals and some traditional Day of the Dead music. I traveled to Oaxaca twice, and uh, my life was forever. Uh, changed with that <laughs> experience. So I hope you enjoy this uh, quick little um, trip down memory lane with me to uh, just kind of illuminate the power of, of good theater. Uh, let's see, I also had to do my music with it. Here we go. Come on now. Hmm. Hold on, give me one second. I'm a little uh, put out as I told you already. <laughs> oh boy. That was an excellent um, presentation. I thank you, Ariel. If I could find my music backdrop, it was working fine when I prepped this. Holy moly. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. Can you all see my screen though? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Get yes. Music on. Thank you. Oh, why the heck is this giving me such a so much trouble? I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. It was working so well. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Perhaps it's coming. Let's see. Ah, so sorry. Oops. Elders. All right. I don't understand. And I'm hearing it somewhere. Oh, my God, you guys. I'm so embarrassed. This is so hard. That's all right. Um, Evelyn, but but maybe in the interest of time, just the pictures. I know, I know, the music would really be valuable. Right. But, you know, you can also send me the the music, and I can kind of like fake it and put it in later. <laughs> <laughs> so let let's see the pictures. I'm sharing now, right? You're totally fine, Evelyn. Uh, it's sharing, and then Lindy also wants you to know that um, the first pop up. If you check the share sound box you might be able to share sound, but, oh. but let perhaps just the, this looks beautiful, so no worries. <laughs> oh, gosh, what a mess. Sorry about that, guys. So there is um, the family in Tijuana, as I said. We had a lot of Latino students that year, so I was able to do this. I, I can't do a lot of Latino work here at USD, but maybe that'll change, become a HSI. Beautiful costumes that danced and were choreographed. This artist from Tijuana who was amazing, who could sing like you wouldn't believe. This young girl who was gonna party in the graves is dancing with death, she's into drugs and thought it'd be fun and has a, an experience on the graveyard that was transformative. 
I cannot believe why this is even doing this here. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Trying to get rid of this. Oh, there we go. Don't worry about it, Evelyn. Um, uh, just a few more minutes to, to hear about your strategy here. So, so um, okay. Pictures are gorgeous. Don't worry about the music. <laughs> Almost over, <laughs> and I'm sorry. No, I wanted you to get a sense of the. Uh, you know, the the workers did a. That's when they were setting up their altar. Um, that was a high school. Um, oh, you recognize it? I think that might have been one for AIDS. Um, different organizations doing their thing. That was your art department. <laughs> There's a skeletons in an actual car. And this one is real significant because it was when the fires of Escondido were happening and we had just done the migrants living in the canyons. So uh, students, our students took up this one to create um, awareness about that. This happened right when those fires were going on. So you saw the fires in the background. Again, telling stories through this, um, just random big puppets. And that's the end. <laughs> okay. And then we had a pachanga. And that was a lot of fun. See the students. Nuns were dancing with skeletons and with students. And it was a big ass pachanga. We had a nice trio at the end, Tijuana. It was amazing. You can see the pianist who played indoors. And that was my ex husband <laughs> who was very supportive. And okay, we're back at the beginning. So I can stop the share and put myself out of my torment here. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> what a mess. Again, I put five things back to back today before I got here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I definitely have questions for later. Okay. Uh, okay. You wanna you wanna fill us in on biology? I you know, I love how, how these uh, presentations are are completely disciplinarily different and we have to fill in the kind of transition um, between them, but um, here comes Kate. So I was just thinking about what a good transition would be and came up blank. I always kind of feel like a square peg in a round hole when I do these humanity center events. I think that's the point is that maybe I'll get less square and the hole will get less round um, the more we all work together. Um, well put. That's, the, <laughs> that's what I'm hoping, but I'm you're going to see. <laughs> so so um, Farah invited me to talk for you all because I work in this region. I'm a biologist and specifically I'm an aquatic ecologist. So I study water in the Colorado des desert in particular. And so she was telling me about this focus on the Imperial Regional Detention Facility and Imperial Valley and thought it might be good to give some biological context for the region. Um, and I love doing that because I think the region is really valuable for um, human, for cultural, for political, and for ecological reasons. And so I, this is gonna be a little bit of a different angle but hopefully it will at least be some valuable context. And because I'm an aquatic ecologist, we'll focus on water. So I've been working along the US-Mexico border for uh, 15 years now in Southern California and Baja, and then also for about eight years in Southern Arizona and Northern uh, Sonora. And so I could talk a whole lot about the politics and the uh, human rights <laughs> tragedies and how those affect wildlife, because I'm sure folks who have worked in this region understand that this would have massive effects on wildlife as well. Um, but instead, I think I'd like to focus a little more on um, valuing this landscape that we often see as having limited value when we look out the window of our car as we drive on eight east. So, um, to do that, I wanna give a little context because um, this area 
in the Imperial Valley is in the Sonoran Desert, which is one of the four great North American deserts. We have the Great Basin, Mojave, Chihuahua, and then the Sonoran Desert. And so if I zoom in on that Sonoran Desert, there are five subregions of the Sonoran Desert. And we're here, here's uh, Salton Sea. And so the detention facility is right here. Farrah, will you nod if you can see my mouth? Great. Um, and so this is in this subsection of the Sonoran Desert called the Lower Colorado River Valley. And we'll talk about why that is in just a minute. But when you hear the phrase Colorado Desert, that's specifically referring to our part of the Lower Colorado River Valley Desert that's in California. So, but we are technically in the Sonoran Desert, even though we don't have saguaro cacti. So it's a, it's a particularly striking desert. We are the most extreme of all of the Sonoran Desert subregions. We only get about three inches of rain per year in the Imperial Valley. Um, it all comes in the winter. Our monsoons in the summer are rare. They happen sometimes, but they're pretty rare. And because of that, the valleys are dominated by these sparse, low plants, creosote, burrowweed, cacti. Um, and we don't have any of those showstopper cacti like the saguaros and the cardones and the, the ones that you think of when you when you think of a classic Sonoran desert. But our our flora here can be over 50% annual plants. There's an incredible seed bank just sitting there waiting at the surface for the rains to come. And that's when you have these big wildflower years that draw so many tourists to the Imperial Valley. Um, but I'm an aquatic ecologist. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the history, like what made this region, geologically speaking, and then why this region, why it's possible for me to study aquatic ecology in the Imperial Valley at all. So here we are, That's the, that star represents the detention facility that we've been discussing. That little blob is the Salton Sea, which will be good for orienting you. And then this here, the snaking, crevice on the landscape, that is the Colorado River. So if I show, if I outline the Colorado River, um, there's the Salton Sea, so Colorado River, Salton Sea, and um, US-Mexico border. And you'll see that the whole drainage of the Colorado River, it's huge, it's massive, it extends over four states, it draws from all over the Rocky Mountains. And so, this pushes massive amounts of sediments down here to its outlet at the Sea of Cortez. Um, and through geologic time, um, the Colorado River has not always looked like this. In fact, it has periodically throughout history flowed through the Salton Trough or the Imperial Valley. And so that area there is called the Salton Trough. And I'll be um, referencing it a few times now because I want to talk about that history of water. It looks so dry now, but really our entire desert region, this whole Colorado desert was created by water. And so to flash backwards in our time machines a little bit, in the Miocene, so that's 23 million years ago, um, this was the ocean. So here's our, here's our valley. Here's the California-Mexico border. And so this, um, this ocean left fossils everywhere, beautiful fossils of, our, of this marine time period in the Anza Borrego Desert currently and in the whole Imperial Valley. It was connected to the ocean for millions of years and it extended far north into Southern California. And while this was happening in the Miocene, the Colorado Plateau was uplifting. And so that's important because the Colorado Plateau uplifting meant that that precipitation and snow melt had to go somewhere. And that's when the Colorado River started flowing. The Colorado River, so now we're at 3 million years ago, the Colorado River is now a thing and it's draining now into the Sea of Cortez, and as it's doing so, it's putting Grand Canyon after Grand Canyon worth of sediment into the Colorado River Delta. And so it filled with these sediments. First, it created the Marine Delta, then it created the Terrestrial Delta, 
and this has continued to happen. It's still happening. We are still transporting sediment into our region here, into the Imperial Valley. And so between three million years ago and the present, um, now the Salton Trough is cut off from the Sea of Cortez. So the Salton Sea is no longer part of the ocean. And in this period, there were many freshwater lakes that were fed by the Colorado River as the Colorado River changed its course through geologic time. It would fill and empty and move around on the landscape. And so it would build this ancient lake called Lake Cahuilla. And so it would fill and dry and fill and dry, depending on the Colorado River. We're currently in a dry period, which has reduced many of these rivers to dry channels and left dry lake beds. But this is where Lake Cahuilla used to be. It used to extend all the way down into Mexico. Here's an actual outline of the river channel of the, the lake bed. We have a great idea of where it used to be because you can still see all of the outlines of the invertebrates, the shells of the mollusks that used to live in this lake. So we know exactly, we can plot exactly where this lake used to be as it filled and dried and filled and dried with the onset and the retreat of Colorado River water through time. So this is a map from today, our current aquatic setup, our current hydrologic landscape for the Salton Sea. Um, but if you've driven across that desert, it doesn't really look like this, right? None of it's that nice minty green color. It doesn't have ribbons of rushing water flowing through. Um, most of it looks more like this. Um, those are those those rivers do exist, but most of them are intermittent and ephemeral, meaning that they dry for parts of the year. And this is why I think it's so easy for us to devalue these landscapes. They don't look like rivers and lakes that we're familiar with from the Pacific Northwest or the Amazon. These are all photos taken in the Colorado River Desert. Um, the habitats down by the detention facility look a lot more like this um, in the lower right-hand corner. This was taken in Carrizo Gorge. Um, but these aquatic habitats, they're not there year round. They're temporary, but they still, and they have this extreme hydrologic variability from year to year, and even from week to week within the same year. Some will remain dry for years at a time. But even so, they house this really large, biodiversity of aquatic organisms. So these are things like damselflies and dragonflies, like these diving water beetles here, water scorpions. Um, these are water striders, back swimmers, giant water bugs, mayflies. All of these organisms are adapted to live in what look like these barren landscapes. And so to me, this is super captivating. This is why I do what I do. I love this region. But it does, it, it's fascinating. You walk out there and you see these landscapes and you wonder how could any, how could anything live there, right? How can you be an aquatic organism and get by when some years there's only a sheen of wet on the surface of the, the substrate? How is that a valuable landscape? So I wanted to show just a little bit here before I finish um, what some of these adaptations are that allow um, these organisms to survive. Farah, I have a few minutes left, right? Okay, great. So there's this great biodiversity despite drying. And that's the case for this entire Imperial Valley region. You can't see it though, much of it is underfoot. So these organisms have morphological adaptations. So that's the shape of the body. They have physiological adaptations like really high heat tolerances, life history adaptations, which means the timing of different life cycle events coincides with the seasons to allow them to pop up when there's water and disappear when there's not. And then some behavioral adaptations. So this is a particularly amazing um, organism that we have living in our region. This is a stonefly, a winter stonefly. It's only about a centimeter long. And previously, they, scientists thought that they, um, they couldn't, figure, couldn't figure out where they lived. There was 
a few of them in Central California and a few of them in Southern Arizona, and nobody knew. It was this really disjunct distribution. And then there was a lot of rain in 2008, and all of these dry washes that just look like sand, just look like desolate habitat. They all flowed for the first time in 10 years. And all of a sudden, these stoneflies popped up all over the place. They did not have a disjunct distribution. They were everywhere. They had been under the sediment for years. And all they needed was that cue of water coming and they popped up and they completed their life cycles. And then their offspring, dug down into the sediment to bury again, waiting for the next rains. This is another similarly amazing adapted organism for our region. Um, this guy, Stanley Dodson, forgot about them on a Petri dish in his lab, and he went away for a week and they dried up and he came back and added water and they popped back up alive. These are the kinds of, this is why our landscape is so special. You don't find these cool adaptations. You don't find organisms that have evolved to live like this, except for in regions that are as extreme as ours. Um, these are black flies that have synchronized. So they need water. They need flow. They have these uh, this little look like little bowling pins and the bottom attached to a rock and the, their heads up here with their little eyelash shaped mouth parts um, stick out into the water. And then the water flows and they feed on little particles in the current. So they need flow to survive. So their adaptation is to synchronize their emergence timing. So they grow really, really, really quickly for that short period of time that water is present in the desert. And then they emerge and fly away as the black flies that you and I know well um, during the dry season. Some organisms are able to track water as it's moving, as the water is receding, some of them are able to make little cocoons where they can survive for years when water is gone. And some of them are even able to crawl over the dry desert to in search of um, wet habitat again. Here's a video that I took of an aquatic dive, uh, a flightless giant water bug that's crawling, well, this is an aquatic organism, crawling through the dry desert in search of water. And so this is my last example here. I wanted to end on this um, just to emphasize um, how special these organisms are that live here. I know that Ariel talked about how we put these detention facilities away to isolate the folks who live in them. Um, and I think that that most people see the desert as this isolated, valueless landscape. And I think that there's a lot of value here, even when we can't see it. Um, and I hope that this has at least given you a little context for what's going on behind the scenes when you're thinking about um, some of these uh, socio-political issues. Thank so, you. You know yeah. that. That actually like literally is going to feed into what we do on our field trip with Manuel, um, uh, where we'll be following the aqueduct um, that, that was on your map. Um, it's called oh, something great. else. So that was very helpful context. Awesome. <laughs> no, no square peg. <laughs> oh, well, good. I don't mind being a square peg. Okay. All right, fine. You can do it. <laughs> uh, Peter, last but not least the economic context. Yes, uh, thank you, Farah, uh, for inviting me to this panel. I think this is uh, about the wildest academic panel that I've been to maybe forever. This is showing uh, how wide the, the range of, of things that, that a university provides can be. And I really enjoyed the, the last three presentations, uh, the wealth of the, the, the visual and also the, the really impactful story that, that Ariel told us about um, the Imperial Valley detention facility. Um, what I want to bring to the table is yet another uh, strange perspective, uh, maybe one that is you know more removed, but uh, I hope uh, might also be useful and might be useful for uh, some of you in, in just comparing different kinds of 
uh, approaching things and, and making sense of things. Uh, so what I'm, what I want to look at, or what I want to do a brief presentation of, is uh, to take a look at the economics of detention. Um, and there's basically two schools in economics that deal with detention and migration and detention. There is a critical school <clears throat> that uh, goes very much into the privatization uh, of detention centers, the the prison industrial complex, uh, the multinational companies that are operating half of the detention centers uh, or the beds that are have been built over the years. Uh, but I want to go uh, in another direction and look a little bit at the very classic uh, economics of uh, rational choice theory and what it can tell us about um, the, the economics of detention and, and what we may be able to see and learn from it. Uh, so I want to look at this um, from going back to the same, to the first question, you know, that, that informs us all, why do these detention centers and what are alternatives to these detention centers? And looking at it from a rational choice perspective, detention centers don't necessarily make sense, right? Why would you have prisons for migrants? Um, it is not, um, prisons um, have usually three or four different um, functions. Uh, one is about rehabilitation and reform of people that have been wrongdoers, which, you know, doesn't apply to immigrants uh, and is certainly not for asylum seekers, uh, but to any immigrant. Uh, it is not about retribution uh, retribution is the idea that uh, the victims uh, of a crime uh, want to see the perpetrator suffer, so to speak. Again, you know, migrants don't do harm to anyone, so this whole rationale falls short. Again, so what else could there be? And the answer that you could find uh, from an economist's perspective is deterrence. Uh, the idea that um, the uh, conditions and the hardship that immigrants go through in a detention center is made to deter future immigrants. That is the 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 idea behind it, and we're going to take a look a little bit at the mathematics of this to see what are the underlying assumptions and what are alternatives, and to what extent this entire structure uh, makes sense. So what I've prepared is. Um, no, no beautiful pictures, just a really boring whiteboard <laughs> um, that looks at, at rational choice and the rational choice of migration, right? And so the idea um, that an economist would bring to bear is that uh, humans can be modeled as uh, rational agents, uh, that humans behave as if they would constantly calculate the costs and the benefits of each action and they would take an action if the benefits outweigh the costs right that is that is the idea behind it and again um, there is there is an, an easy criticism that says but humans are not always rational um, that is that falls a little bit short the idea is not that humans are exactly uh, cost benefit analyzers every minute of the day uh, but that in aggregate, uh, if we think about them that way, it matches onto the real behavior, right? So if you think about a clockwork, uh, that uh, clock that tells you when the sun is going down, it's not that anyone believes that the universe operates like a set of springs and wheels, uh, but if we use this model, which is a clockwork, we can foretell when the sun will go up and down. So it's the same idea to have a model as abstract as that might be usually mathematical, but if it matches onto real behavior, then it has some utility. If it doesn't, it doesn't have utility. Uh, and one, one important concept that is also uh, worth talking about here is the concept of utility. Uh, what, we, what humans measure is utility, the benefit uh, that you get out of something. Happiness could be one synonym for this. And so if we uh, and I'm going to try to make this uh, super simple, you know, for the for the sake of of, a, of a, almost a caricature explanation. So forgive me for 
you know, not using the right concepts and for simplifying something that is way more complex, but I really I want to take it down to the, to the simplest level possible. Um, so when we look at the cost of migration, um, we can think of um, uh, costs that migrants face, right? One is the uh, uncertainties of travel. It's going to be complicated, it's going to take time, uh, it will not be pleasant. So let's say travel has a utility of negative 100 points. Right. There is another cost uh, that we can think about, and that is leaving family behind. Again, this is a mini shorthand for a lack of communities of support, uh, a lack of uh, cultural familiarity, you know, you name it. There is a way bigger concept behind this, but let's call it here no family, right? And uh, say the travel has a limited negative uh, utility because it's the migration itself is going to uh, end soon, but having no family is something much more longer lasting. So let's give it a minus 500 of utility. So the cost of migration here uh, would be. Yes. Alina. Oh, okay. Alina, I thought it was. <laughs> sorry okay, about that. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. No, no problem. If there is any question, and this is what economists do too, they, they interrupt each other. If, if there's any questions immediately or any comments, jump right in. I'll be happy to uh, to answer them right away. Um, so if we in this like, you know, almost caricature model of migration right now, for in terms of rational choice, we have minus 600 of negative uh, utility of migration, um, but then if we look at the benefit of migration, uh, let's call it economic prosperity, and that would be, for example, 2,000 points, right? So a migrant in this model chooses, uh, assume, uh, estimates the cost uh, of migration, that's minus 600, the benefit would be prosperity of 2,000, so the benefits outweigh the cost, and therefore uh, migrating is a rational choice. Right? This is how far this model goes so far. Um, then uh, we need to. This is this is the simple version. Then we need to uh, make this a little bit more complex. I wonder if I can get. It. Let's see if I can. And we take it to expected utility. What is expected utility? Um, that is a concept that, that takes it, that tries to go get a little bit closer to how we actually calculate benefits uh, and, and drawbacks. And we, we do that by looking at the probability of something happening times the utility. Because not everything happens with 100% utility, or with 100% probability. So if we uh, take this again if we go back to this model of it. And I think it won't let me. Oh, am I able to change this? I don't think I am. Okay. So if we take um, uh, the utility of travel. Uh, and we and you know everyone knows the the cost of travel is going to be real. So we have a probability of one hundred percent. This is definitely going to happen. Um, so as a result, we stay at the minus one hundred, right? So this is really putting numbers on some calculations that people are doing, or are supposed to be doing that we model them as doing. If we think of the probability of leaving family behind, that probability is one hundred percent. That is a certainty. So again. We can multiply this by one, and the outcome is minus 500. Um, if we look at the probability of prosperity, this is a little bit less certain, right? Um, migrants cannot be sure that their economic lives will be better. They can assume, they can hope, and they can judge from uh, what they see, uh, maybe, uh, that there will be prosperity, but I think um, the, the calculation could be, um, for example, 
So if you multiply 2,000 of probability by an 80% chance of that happening, you arrive at, a, at an expected utility of 1,600 points, right? Um, again, the benefits outweigh the costs, and it still is uh, a rational choice to go uh, and migrate. And here's, here's the, the, the part why all this matters. This is where detention comes in. Detention uh, is thought to be a cost that um, would elevate uh, the overall cost of migration to the point that it outweighs the benefit. Right? So if you look at detention, detention is again not certain. And so let's say um, you might expect to be caught when you are uh, crossing the border uh, with a one in four chance. So your probability is a 25% uh, chance of being detained. And we multiply, so the, the negative um, utility of detention could be minus 4,000. Right? We multiply this by 0.25, and so the expected utility is negative 1,000. And now we add them up. Right? We have the cost of, of travel, we have the cost of losing family, and we have the cost of probable detention, and all of that makes us reach minus 1,600. So this is the theoretical point at which a migrant will be indifferent between moving or not moving. And this is when, uh, and this is this is a rationale that that policymakers uh, that have um, argued for the expansion of detention centers and for the expansion of um, of the criminalization of migration uh, have in mind. This is the this is the economic rationale behind it. Um, because the 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 um, this is this is an element in the cost benefit equation that can be changed, right? How do you make migration even less attractive by either increasing the probability of being detained? Um, so if you raise the probability from uh, twenty five percent to fifty percent, the expected utility is going to be minus two thousand, right? So the more uh, border control agents you put. It, throughout the country, um, the more costly migration will be, and we can we, we also see this happening. And this is not a an uh, an, an old idea, right? The, when you, when we're looking at uh, detention and detention as a as a political choice, uh, we see this in the um, in the late seventies, in the early eighties, the Mariel boat lift. Uh, in 1981 was an, was a big uh, watershed moment when the Reagan administration decided uh, that um, allowing immigrants to uh, file an asylum claim and meanwhile give them a work permit is not going to be enough of a deterrence and therefore the lives of asylum seekers and immigrants needs to be made more miserable by detaining them and therefore uh, that should work as a detention. That is that is the rationale behind it. And so there's two ways of increasing the cost of migration. One is by increasing the chance of being detained, and the other one of making detention, life in detention, worse. So I can change the probability here of 0.25, or I can change the 4,000 here. Right? If I change 4,000 to 8,000 and make detention even more miserable, then again, the expected utility, negative utility of migration will increase and therefore more less people are expected to migrate. And this applies to asylum seekers, this applies to uh, migrants of all sorts and for all reasons. So this is a very, very you know, rational, mathematical, cold-hearted way of thinking of why humans do the things they do. Um, but there is several flaws in this that are also understood by economists in the rational choice tradition. Uh, one of them has to do with information. Um, migrants 
often don't have a lot of information about the legal system of the country where they're going to. They might not be aware that um, crossing the border will lead to detention. Uh, they might not be aware that this could be a criminal investigation. They're, they are not. They do not know the details of a migration law in the country where they're going. So deterrence does not work um, if you don't know what the consequences of your uh, of, of migration are, the costs that you're facing. Um, and therefore, you can see this also uh, that the U.S., for example, has uh, instituted a lot of. Um, information campaigns in El Salvador, in Honduras, Guatemala, uh, to inform uh, prospective migrants about the cost of migration, right? And this is some information that might reach some families and might dissuade them from, uh, or some future migrants and might dissuade them from migrating. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you have also information from other people who have made it through, who have different assessments of how easy or hard it is to be caught. and um, of uh, you have, uh, for example, smugglers uh, that will give you a different picture of how easy it is to migrate. So that information uh, goes both ways. That doesn't mean uh, that any of these campaigns or any of this, the information that reaches migrants' families is anything close to uh, um, uh, correct or, or empirically based. And then there is something that is, um, I think, more important, and that has to do with the situation uh, that many asylum seekers are facing. And that has to do with the cost and benefits of staying at home. So we have costs and benefits again. Uh, the benefits of staying at home are pretty clear, right? You can stay with family, and that is, um, let's put it in positive terms, 1 times 100. Uh, you can stay in a place where you know the culture, where you are, we have a network of support uh, where you can speak your native language, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when you look at the cost in some of uh, the cases that we see in Honduras, in, in El Salvador, and, and other places where people are facing uh, massive human rights violations, is, um, to again, put it simply, uh, the chance of death, for example, right? In, in places that have, uh, in, where communities have faced a lot of crime, where families uh, have seen uh, family members uh, die uh, or people in the community being shot, um, you can try to assess uh, what the chances are of you surviving and if you stay at home. And if we look at the different kinds of, of um, utility, the negative utility of death is really high, right? So prosperity is a positive 1,600. Detention might be a negative 4,000. Death, we can put this at a million. Um, so what that means is basically dying is a thousand times worse uh, than being detained. You know, and then again, you know, you can make an argument: is it 10 times? Is it 100 times? Is it 10,000 times worse? Um, and then uh, people also assess the probability of being uh, of dying in their lifetime, and what you can see here, even if the probability of being um, killed in your lifetime, you, if you assess this as a 1% chance, the number you arrive at is still, so death would be a negative million, uh, that number would still be minus 10,000. Do you see this? And so the negative utility that you derive from your fear of, of bodily harm and of death is so massive that um, no matter what happens on the, on the cost-benefit uh, side of migration, it will always swamp it. And so there are um, some people, some hardcore fundamentalists that argue, given that this is the situation, we need to make detention even worse, right? You need to increase the negative utility of detention so much that it is almost as bad as dying at home. That is the most hard-nosed, and you, you will find politicians who make that argument. Um, and there's other people who say, well, in order to deter migration, we need to change 
the left side of this equation. We need to change the expected probability of dying from, from violence in your home country. And this is when we see uh, other politicians and, and you know, uh, um, political outreach that looks at um, improving the, the situation, the security situation in the Southern Triangle, for example. So all of these actions and all of these conversations that are happening uh, in, in the political level, you can put numbers on them and you can try to make sense of them in a very simple um, mathematical model uh, that tries to model very complex decisions that humans make uh, with just simple cost and um, cost benefit calculations. Um, there's another part, uh, other people would argue that this entire system doesn't make any sense uh, for several reasons. That humans are not uh, meaningfully modeled as uh, rational choice, as utility maximizers. And there's two arguments, I think, and this is where, where I close, two arguments that, that make kind of immediate sense. One is, if you are under distress, and this comes from behavioral economics, if you're under distress, if you're in a, situ a life-threatening situation, as many asylum seekers are, you do not make a rational choice. Uh, the the um, negative sides that you feel at home are much more certain than the uh, expected costs uh, from migration. So you do not make a rational choice. You just need to, you want to avoid the devil you know. So there is the, the whole idea of, of making a rational cost-benefit uh, calculation falls short in this. And there's another argument that says um, migration decisions are not necessarily made by individuals. These are often family choices. And so you might have individuals that by themselves would not um, take the risk of migration because the costs for them personally outweigh the benefits, but they do it for their families. And so they, they are willing to undergo a sacrifice for the sake of their families. So their cost benefit calculations are different and are not modeled meaningfully by an individual model of utility maximizers. So these are two kinds of criticism that take on the entire model of rational choice. But a lot of the policy actions that you see and a lot of thinking of what can be alternatives to detention can be derived from, you know, these 15 numbers that are just scribbled on this, on this blackboard. So this is just a, a quick introduction of uh, how some economists can think about detention and the alternatives to it. That's all. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we only have uh, a few minutes left on the clock, um, and I think it was really worth it to hear all of that um, uh, information and all those different perspectives um, as we build this, uh, this collective thought um, project. Um, but if, if there is any one kind of closing question, um, you're welcome to, uh, to, to ask, um, and any further questions, um, you can email to me um, and I will put them to any of the individual speakers, um, especially as the student cohort um, kind of builds its own kind of questions and uh, strategies going forward. But in the meantime, thank you so much. And um, if there isn't any further question today, uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Thank you guys. It was really lovely.